I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi there, I'm Michael Ansel, uh, and I'm here to talk about how we've been looking at security, and particularly security around chat ops at Box over the course of the last year, year and a half. First, who am I? I am one of the site reliability engineers at Box. My job is to keep the site up and make sure that everything new we build doesn't bring the site down. Uh, I focus on our infrastructure and making sure that we enable our developers to make their services reliable uh, so that they can scale as, as our customer base grows. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or on Freenode or probably in lots of other places. Um, Scale-wise, we have hundreds of developers working on over 50 independent services running across many thousands of servers in multiple data centers. Um, so we run into some interesting problems around team scale uh, with that. As James just discussed, chat ops really is awesome. Uh, if you dump all of your alerts into chat, you don't have to have a single person on call. You can have the entire team on call during the day and distribute the load across the team rather than having one person who's responsible for channeling all of the different alerts. Anybody who sees the alert can immediately start acting on it. You don't have to wait until that one person who's on call gets out of the bathroom and comes and actually starts responding to the alert. Once you start seeing that, anybody can start pulling up graphs. You can all look at them together and have the same context going into an issue. You don't have one person pulling up a graph, looking at it, thinking about it, deciding it's a useful graph, posting it to chat, trying to explain what's going on, telling people where to look in the graph. Instead, you just pull the graph up together. You all have a conversation about it. You all see it. Uh, and you can move at the same flow. This has the added benefit, if anybody comes into an issue later, they just scroll up in chat history and they can see, here's the graphs that people were looking at. They don't have to click each link and pull it up in TSDB, pull it up in Graphite. It's all right here in front of them and they can just read it all as a single conversation flow. Once you do decide that there is a problem that needs to get fixed, then you can fire off your incident, your incident response process. You can have the bot page other people who are on call. You can have it update Twitter. You can have it post to your status page. You can have it email out to the whole company. You can kind of take care of your whole incident response flow with one command and then get back to the important thing, which is fixing the problem. Now, uh, once you have this thing, uh, things we started looking at Box were, well, OK, getting information in chat and doing some of the simpler things uh, is really, really cool. But how about if we started taking actions and actually changing things about our infrastructure? Um, we've been rolling out a AnyCast-based internal load balancer solution. And disabling an AnyCast load balancer is a non-trivial task. You need to start modifying BGP. And you need to understand kind of what's going on in there. So. Rather than trying to have people learn how to do all of that stuff, why don't we just integrate this all into the bot and have the bot go update BGP announcements, disable your load balancers, let them drain, let you know whenever they've finished draining and they're now ready for any kind of maintenance. An area where we saw this break down a little bit is, well, what happens when you need to disable a faulty database master? There's more work than just actually disabling it. You need to pick a slave to promote into place uh, and start moving down that process. So we put in promotions, or we started looking at, OK, what would it take to promote a database, have it promote, then you can disable the former master that's now a slave, uh, pull it out of service discovery, and continue the whole process. This was really, really exciting when we started thinking of these ideas. Uh, but then we also brought up another interesting point, which is, what happens when your front desk decides that this would be fun to promote a random slave into, into the master place uh, and disable an old database? You start, things start to get really, really scary, and you as a company end up kind of sad. Uh, when we realized this at Box, we too were kind of sad because we wanted to roll out chat ops, but until it was secure, there's no way that we're ever letting it touch our production environment. Uh, at Box, Security is kind of important to us. We have companies in lots of highly regulated industries that need to deal with things like PCI compliance, HIPAA, FINRA, FERPA, FedRAMP, all of those big fancy names that have a million rules, some of which are awesome, some of which are kind of silly. Uh, we have to meet every single one of those. Uh, so until we found a way to solve this problem, we couldn't roll out chat ops at Box. What it came down to was figuring out who do you trust uh, with all different parts of your chat system. Uh, who do you trust with your chat conversations? Do you trust a cloud vendor to keep your conversations safe, or do you require that your conversations be kept on premises or in maybe your corporate environment, or do they actually need to be limited only to production? 
Who do you trust with authenticated access to your production environment? Is it only someone who has gone through all of the two-factor steps, or do you allow some cloud system to access? So are you hosting your bot on Heroku, or does your bot have to live in a corporate environment or live uh, inside production? And then finally, who do you trust to perform different commands? Do you trust everyone in the company to perform all commands? Or do you only trust certain individuals to do things? In the database example, do you trust everyone to promote? Or do you only trust your DBAs to do that database promotion? Um, now, a little bit of a rundown into how we started looking at this. Uh, within Hubot, you, you start with a message. and um, a message is going to get matched against a whole bunch of different regular expression patterns. Um, with that, if I put in that I want corgis, then I get back corgis. I don't get back something else. If I put in red alert, I'm going to get back the whole red alert, uh, fire off the incident response flow. Or if I want to deploy code, then the code's going to get deployed. Uh, with this system, there it turns out to be very, very difficult to introduce additional logic to say, well, I don't want to allow certain people to deploy code, but I want to allow other people, I want to allow everybody to put in corgis because corgis are awesome. Um, it, we would have to modify every single script along the way. So we started looking at what were scalable, maintainable ways to introduce custom logic into this flow uh, without having to actually modify all of the scripts that already exist. We want to be able to leverage what exists and share what we create without having to entangle that with our specific security needs. Uh, the conclusion we came to was building a middleware stack that goes in the middle. And middleware allows you to intercept that flow between matching and saying, this is what we're intending to execute, and then actually executing it. So you can say, corgis are fine, but deployments are not. This is the bit of code that Jimmy mentioned earlier, just got merged today. So I'm kind of excited. That's been about a year's worth of work to, to get that pulled together, figure out the right interface, and get this baked into Hubot. So once we had this foundational piece and allowed us to introduce control into the entire flow of message processing, we started coming up with what are the different ways that we actually want to control the message flow. The first one was pretty simple. Put in LDAP groups. Check to see uh, you want to promote. Are you in the database group? If you're not in the database group, you're not allowed to do database promotions because we assume that we are working to the assumption that they are the experts and they're the ones who should be doing this work, not someone else. Uh, the, that helps uh, if you trust your chat system to authenticate users and that the chat system is not going to lie about who a user is. Uh, it also assumes that uh, passwords haven't been compromised. All of your standard basic, you had a username and a password, and that's it. The next step was introduce two-factor. Prove that the user is actually present at the system uh, and that their credentials haven't been compromised. Maybe there's been a global compromise of the chat system, but at least there hasn't been local compromise of a single user. So in this case, you go in, you try to execute a command. The bot comes back and says, hold on, you need a two-factor. So you hop into chat and do the exact same flow. You say, all right, authenticate me with two-factor. You send a push notification to my phone. Let me approve that. And then you can continue on with the flow. This still this prevents local compromise of accounts, but doesn't, prevent, doesn't protect against global compromise of the chat system. So kind of the, the cream of the crop top, top level was, OK, what if we don't trust the chat system at all? We want to protect against a chat system being compromised. We can't trust any message going through that system. We need a way to protect against that system being completely owned. For this, we built in message signatures. So we built a custom plugin for Adium that will take an RSA key, sign every message destined for the bot, forward the signature onto the chat bot in parallel to the message, and then you pre-register your public key with the bot. The bot can then validate that this message came from the user who says they sent it. The message wasn't modified in transit. You now have this fully signed system uh, that doesn't require any trust of the chat system at all, but allows you to communicate over this, this clear channel. Uh, all of these things gave us a lot of information around who a user was, 
but we didn't necessarily know that they were always allowed to do it. The LDAP groups help, but a lot of times we want to ha- we want to require something like the nuclear bomb keys, where you need two people to approve things. Uh, you want to make sure that somebody types something, somebody else needs to code review it. That's a standard practice in code. Why isn't it a standard practice in infrastructure? So we added a system of peer approvals. Whenever you go in, you ask to do something, the bot says, hold on, I need somebody else to approve this. At this point, I get someone else who has some idea what's going on to hop into chat, approve my commit, approve my change, that my command, and then the bot immediately picks up where it left off and continues through the entire flow. Um, this can layer on the same kind of uh, LDAP checks or two-factor checks or anything that we had before for approvals. So you can say that um, only SREs can request promotion of a database master and only DBAs can be the ones to approve it. And it requires these different separation of duties, which comes back to the compliance regimes and the different things that different requirements we have to meet as a company. Overall, using these and any other techniques you can dream up, securing chat ops is easy. Uh, there's no excuse not to do it. Um, you shouldn't trust some random system completely outside of your infrastructure to, to make changes. Don't, don't put your company's reputation and uptime on the line. Uh, find a way to secure your chat system and, um, and really make chat ops awesome but secure at the same time. So uh, hit me up on Freenode or on Twitter or anywhere else. I'll post my slides uh, as soon as I head home. Uh, and we take a look. Any questions? person's computer has been hacked or whatever, whatever you want to call it, and all you rely on is an RSA key. Right. So there's uh, the question was how do you how do you protect against endpoint compromise? So if a, if a user's laptop is compromised and they have an RSA key on there, how do you make sure that you're protected against that? There's two parts to that. One is you invest a lot in endpoint security. Uh, anytime you have an endpoint that is given privileged access, so imagine you have a terminal open with SSH open. If your laptop is compromised from the standpoint of someone can interact with your ter- your open terminal session, uh, your system is completely owned because they've they've compromised a user. Uh, the other option, the another way to look at that is if you compromise a user's brain, namely you convince a user to do something that they shouldn't, uh, you're still compromised. So you, the first part is you invest a huge amount in endpoint security and make sure that the points that you do give privileged access are protected. And the second part is add two-factor. Uh, the RSA key could be compromised if the laptop was compromised, uh, but your two-factor token should never be compromised uh, unless they compromise both the laptop and the phone. And at that point, you start getting into nation state attacks. That's a whole different can of worms. How are you doing to the doctor? Uh, we just have a cloud two-factor provider that you can use to do any kind of different. So YubiKeys is an easy way to, to do it. But uh, any any two-factor provider could be doing this as long, could do this as long as they have an API. There there's a, a, we're planning to open source. Uh, what we've got that we've been mostly waiting until middleware merged to open source our stuff because it's kind of useless without all the middleware stuff. But now that that's merged, that's the next thing I might to do list this week is uh, this week and next week is to actually get all the stuff we've written open sourced. So. Uh, there's a scenario that I've been pondering for a while um, where a user is making a, a chat ops user is, is uh, wants to execute some command that needs to authenticate with some third party service as that person rather than as the bot account or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, wondering if, if any of the stuff you did here dealt with that flow and how you dealt with it. Uh, part, part of it was that, that I was concerned about is how do you how does that user prove to the third party service who they are without giving the bot the power to impersonate that user? Right. So the question is how do you deal with proxy authentication? Uh, it's something we've thought about. It's not something we've solved yet. Uh, the the general solution with a protocol that already exists is Kerberos, because you can you can start passing tickets around and have tickets that you would generate a ticket on your side that you pass to the chat bot. The bot is then allowed to exchange that ticket for another ticket that it can proxy on. Uh, at some point, you do have to trust the bot to perform actions on your behalf. 
you still want to protect against giving the bot god access. You shouldn't let the bot do anything more than what a properly authenticated user should do. But there is definitely a point when you have to trust that the bot will perform actions on behalf of users. Um, if you want to bypass that, I'm not sure how you can do that through chat um, without having some kind of signed encrypted message that goes through chat, passes through the chat bot, and the chat bot just hands it off to some other system that can then validate it came from a user. I would imagine you could do the same thing that we did with message signatures, but, but we haven't gotten that far yet. Speaking of the message signatures mm -hmm. thing in Adium, how exactly did, is that implemented? Like you mentioned that it's out of band in addition to how you send it. So you're, you're sending a command to the public channel, which is just plain mm -hmm. text, and then you're simultaneously signing that same message as it's sent to be verified. Like, is that a plugin for Adium? Is that mm -hmm. Adium only? Yes. Um, so the, the question is, how, how are we doing the message signing flow and sending those two parallel messages? Uh, or what, how are we setting the messages? So you, it is a plugin for Adium. Uh, you just, it's an Objective C plugin that one of our, one of the members of our security team wrote that plugs into Adium, listens for the message is about to be sent event within Adium, intercepts that, takes the message, adds in a timestamp and I don't know a couple other things to prevent replay attacks. Signs or signs the whole thing, and then sends a private message to the bot in parallel. So you end up sending double messages. So you double the load on your chat system for all chatbot commands. But I imagine every single chat system out there can handle that load just fine. Um, and so yeah, you kind of send those those two messages in parallel. One of them being visible in the channel, the other one being just a private message to the bot. So are you? Uh, I mean, I understand that you can't talk about it, but yeah. what are you guys actually using as your chat platform using? We've got a. We're running OpenFire, just internal XMPP. We're kind of bouncing around looking at better solutions because OpenFire is a pain in the butt. But uh, but yeah, we're bouncing around looking at different things. Do we want to take IRC and put a really beautiful front end on front in front of it, or do we want to try to do something with Slack or HipChat on prem? Um, and for our specific needs, we've been really really hesitant to trust any kind of cloud vendor. But um, but we're, yeah, we're still we're still teasing through that, trying to figure out what what chat solution do we like the most beyond what we've already got. All righty, thank you very much.